But this is a conundrum for a lot of people because they look at it, the U.S. objectively, okay, our, our debt to GDP ratio is over 130%, the highest in U.S. history. The way when you look at other countries in the world, you say, okay, who, who's at that lunch table, you know, 130%? The answer is Lebanon, Greece, uh, Italy. Th those are, your, those are your, your lunch partners, so to speak. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. I'm happy to say that you're in for a real treat here, folks. Stephanie Pomboy is stepping into the guest host chair again today, and she's interviewing one of the top macro icons in the business today, Jim Rickards. Enjoy. Uh, don't adjust your dials, folks. This is, in fact, the Wealthy On channel. Uh, I'm Stephanie Pomboy of Macro Mavens, and I am guest hosting for Adam Taggart today. Um, so we're third time, hopefully, will be the charm here. Um, this time, I have the great privilege of interviewing none other than Jim Rickards, and I've been just so excited, really looking forward to this interview because I honestly think there is no one smarter on the macro scene than Jim. Uh, he's written so many books, I can't even list them all here, um, but just a really shrewd observer of the macro scene and uh, the currency markets in particular, which is what I'd love to kick off the discussion with today. So Jim, welcome and thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you, Steph. It's great to be with you. Uh, and uh, yeah, I look forward to this. I. Um, I've, I've been fortunate to have a lot of really smart hosts and journalists ask questions. Um, it's rarely the case that the host knows more technically than I do, but that's okay. I'll try to rise, rise to the occasion, but I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's not good to start an interview with a bald faced lie, but it's, <laughs> it's flattery. I'll call it flattery. Thank okay. you. Uh, but you are definitely the expert here. Uh, but I'm going to, uh, I'd like to start if we could, um, with a very narrow lens, and then we can step back and broaden it out. But the narrow uh, focus I'd like to start with, since it's the topic of the day, is the dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm going to throw red meat to the wolves here by uh, citing a headline across Bloomberg earlier from Larry Summers talking about how the dollar can continue to move higher because the U.S. has all these great fundamental advantages this comes, you know, 24 hours after another Bloomberg headline talked about the unstoppable strength in the dollar. So there's the red meat for you, and I'll let you gnaw on that for a little bit. <laughs> well, it may come as a surprise. I think I think Larry Summers was half right, and I've, I've met him a number of times. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. He's always, I, I, uh, I almost always agree with his analysis and then disagree with his policy. So I always have to stop halfway with Larry Summers. Like, good analysis, Larry, but you're you're going going the wrong way. Um, but yeah, I think he's right that the dollar will get stronger if that's even possible. I mean, of course it's possible, but it seems like it can't go on any longer. But I think it will, and I think the Bloomberg headline uh, is probably correct. Also, where I disagree, and this is critical, is the reason why. The dollar is getting stronger for some very bad reasons, meaning bad in terms of the macro economy, what's, what probably lies ahead, what is probably telling us. Um, so let's just maybe step back and not be Larry Summers for a minute, but just be everyday investors and asset allocators and analysts and, and say, um, and I hate to use the word conundrum because Greenspan used it, but conundrum is a fancy way of saying, I don't really understand what's going on. But, um, but this is a conundrum for a lot of people because they look at it, the US objectively, okay, our, our debt to GDP ratio is over 130%, the highest in US history. Um, tons of research coming from, um, obviously, Ken Rogoff, but really Carmen Reinhardt, Vincent Reinhardt, and others, but many others, not just them, that says um, at those debt to GDP ratios, you, um, you can't grow. Uh, you, you can maybe refinance and muddle through, but it always ends either in um, default, which is unlikely because we can print the money, that much is true, or um, extreme inflation where here's your trillion dollars back, good luck buying a loaf of bread. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But what, the way it's playing out in real time is that the US uh, economic growth is incredibly weak. So we've got high, uh, sky high debt to GDP ratio. By the way, when you look at other countries in the world, you say, okay, who, who's at that lunch table, you know, 130%? The answer is Lebanon, Greece, 
uh, Italy. Th those are your those are your, your lunch partners, so to speak. And this not, is not like a, the scene from Animal House. Would you like to be <laughs> yeah. fighting Jugdash and Muhammad? <laughs> that's, that's a good that, that's a good comparison. Um, economic growth is weak. Uh, we're in a recession. I don't care what Janet Yellen says. I don't consider her expert on the topic, but we've had our two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Like it or not, that's the definition of recession. Um, the fact that the National Bureau of Economic Research which is a private group, by the way, but they're the recognized referees on recessions and recoveries. The fact that they haven't said so doesn't mean anything because they never do say so until you know nine months or a year um, after it happened. And for that matter, most recessions are two quarters, some three, some have been longer, but but most recessions are a couple of quarters. The, the National Bureau of Economic Research usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery. And they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last January. Uh, okay, so they'll probably get back to us, I, I would bet heavily after the election, but um, uh -huh. we'll, we'll, we'll hear from them at some point. But we're in a recession now and people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It, it, they miss sometimes, they're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, get, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which you know don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think. Here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number. But uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Yeah. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Yes. Two days later, it was 1.6, and now it's down to 1.3. So it's following that pattern. I would expect by the end of September, we still got three weeks to go, given what I said about how it fades, it, it, it doesn't have to be negative, but it could very well be negative, maybe three quarters of decline in GDP, but whatever it is, it's going to be weak. So if it's positive, you know, two tenths or three tenths, I mean, that's okay, but you're still rounding our way from recession. It doesn't mean the problem's over. So uh, debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably had a recession in the first half. Maybe that's continuing. Um, people talk unemployment close to an all-time low, went up a little bit in the last report. Yeah, but uh, even at 3.5% or so, uh, that that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably 8 to 10 million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working, um, prim, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old, who are not in the workforce. Yeah. Um, that's that's That measure is picked up in labor force participation rate, which is uh, low. I mean, that was, that peaked around 70% in 19, sorry, in 2000, uh, main, up from the 1970s. And that was women coming into the workforce and other factors. Uh, but now it's down to around 62 percent and change it ticked up a little bit in the last report but it's still extremely low it's never 100 i mean there's always you could be um, a homemaker a, a student um they're they're uh retired early retirees there are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce but not you know taking 10 percent off or 14 percent decline uh from the starting place in um uh over 20 years that's uh so if you, if you throw those people into the un they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10%, which is a recession or depression level, actually. Um, so, and, and I could go on, but the point is there, there are all kinds of signs of weakness. So, you know, if, if we have the deficit, uh, where, um, you know, the baseline deficit is a trillion, that's before uh, an extra two trillion for Trump's COVID relief, uh, an extra two, three trillion for Biden's COVID relief, if you include the, uh, 
a ludicrously named Inflation Reduction Act right. uh, and, right. and, you know, and, and the American Rescue Act and uh, the Infrastructure Act. Call it what you want. It's it's still three to four trillion. Yeah. Two for Trump. That's six on top of two baseline. That's eight trillion dollars in two years. So your deficit's out of control and your trade deficit's out of control. Mm -hmm. So what's not to like? Um, <laughs> and yet you, you look at all that and you say, well, what, what are you kidding me? I mean, get me out of the dollar. Get me, go get yeah. anything else. Uh, why is the dollar so strong? And the answer is for this, you have to go behind the curtain. You have to look into the, what's called the plumbing of the international monetary system. And I had a discussion um, and this goes back, this is 1980. Uh, so I'm a, you know, an up, young, up and coming vice president of Citibank. That's back, uh, back in the days when it was a bank before they turned it into a hedge fund. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm like a 27 or whatever, a 28 maybe year old lawyer. Um, but I'm, I'm talking to Walter Riston. It's you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He was, mm -hmm. for those who don't know the name or don't recall, he was probably the second greatest banker of the 20th century after Pierpont Morgan. So I'll give Morgan the prize. Uh, yeah. But he, he left around 1910. Uh, but um, and Riston was the inventor of the euro dollar. Uh, oh, so the, the the negotiable certificate of deposit, euro dollars are around a little bit earlier. But he took the CD that that represent that was your interest in the euro dollar, and made them negotiable and tradable. Um, so I'm having a conversation with him, and I I had just seen this movie, which I highly recommend. As Chris Christopherson, Hume Cronin, and Jane Fonda, it's called Rollover. Uh, and it's again 1980, but all star cast. Yeah, I got a murder mystery, a little sex thrown in, but it's uh, it's basically about the collapse of confidence in the US dollar. And Hume mm. Cronin plays the Walter Riston part. Um, and basically, the idea was the remember, this is during the, the Arab oil embargoes and the Iranian oil embargo, and price of oil quadrupled in eight years and all that. So the, the theme was the, the Arabs are taking the money out of the banking system and buying gold. And they're stashing the gold away. And this is the, the collapse of the financial system. And that, that was sort of the plot. So I <laughs> said, you know, uh, Mr. Riston, uh, uh, what about that? You know, everyone took their money out of the system and uh, bought gold. Wouldn't that collapse the system? And he looked at me like I was a new kid on the block, which I was. And he said, well, what you have to understand is that you can take your money out of the bank and you can buy gold. But the person who sold you the gold got the money and they put it back in the bank. So it doesn't go anywhere. It's a closed circuit. And of course, now I'm like, oh, oh yeah, you're right. Of course, he's right. Um, and he said, so the, the uh, stability of the system doesn't depend on who sells what for dollars. Yeah, it affects exchange rates a little bit and um, uh, interest rates with the price of gold. But he said the money always, it can't literally disappear it has to go back into the system it's a closed circuit and of course that's how the euro dollar system works um but the one thing we um uh but it presupposes that you can always borrow in the euro dollar market in other words every, that closed circuit uh analogy is correct provided the big banks are willing to lend to each other so if the mm -hmm. my example if ubs was selling the gold and to the arabs and they got the money and they put it back in Citibank nassau it's all good um but what happens if that money supply now i'm talking about euro dollars uh actually shrank uh mm -hmm. and that is a heart attack in the global financial system so now uh we're like well okay what's going on and believe it or not there's a global dollar shortage. And when you say that, people say, wait a second, Are you kidding me? The Fed printed, you know, the, the Fed's balance sheet in 2008 at the start of the global financial crisis was $800 billion. It was four and a half trillion by the time we got to the end of the taper in, in uh, November, 2014. Then, okay, um, yelling a little bit, but mostly Powell got it. They started quantitative tightening. They got it back down to around 3.5 trillion by the time COVID came along and then boom, it's up to seven and a half trillion, it might've gone higher than that. And that's M0, um, you know, M1 was, was exploding even more. So people go, well, so the Fed printed, you know, seven and a half trillion dollars. How could there be a, how could there be a dollar shortage? Um, and that, that has a two part answer. One is the money printing, at least M0 is irrelevant. It just doesn't matter because they, how do they print the money? Well, they, 
the Fed buys securities from the primary dealers. And I, I was, after I left Citibank, I joined one of the biggest primary dealers and I was there for 10 years. So I had a front row seat. That was, that was back in the days when the Fed was okay. actually, was actually tough on people. I, I was once, uh, I used to go to the Fed all the time. I was once at a meeting, New York Fed anyway. There was a guy, I won't mention his name, kind of legendary. He actually, he actually started to come across the table at me. Like it was like a, a threat wow. of violence because he didn't like what I was doing. There, was a lot of, there were a lot of Irish running the bank at the time. So they were, they, they could be that way. But um, I'm part Irish, so I can say that. But uh, they were, but he started coming over the table at me. And, uh, but uh, that, um, that we got through that. So, but my point is, um, I was a, a council of primary dealer. We talked to the Fed every day. And so the primary dealers are the ones where the Fed open market does, the New York Fed does monetary policy. They buy, so they call up Goldman Sachs or City or whoever. So you offer me, you know, five-year notes or two-year notes or whatever. Here's a price done. The, the banks send the securities to the Fed and the Fed pays for it with money that comes out of thin air. There's, there's nothing more to it than that. But here's, here's, the, here's the part that matters. What do the banks do with that money? They give it back to the Fed in the form of excess reserves, the bank deposit at the Fed, in effect. Mm -hmm. So that money never went anywhere. It was created. It is on the balance sheet, but it all went to the asset side, which were securities, and it never went into the economy. So where does the money come from that runs the economy? If you know you or I want to go shopping or go out to the multiplier, or, right? Or Isn't that where well, yeah. it comes from the commercial banks? It comes from M1. Yeah, there is a multiplier. But it, that's in M1 and M2, which is created by the banks at will. And the Fed, those commercial banks have as much printing power as the Fed. They just do it differently by lending money or, or, um, or buying securities and, and paying for them with money that they create. So, and, and that never happened. Um, it, it happened to some extent but not nearly to the extent that what the, what the Fed was doing with M0. So M0 didn't really matter. I mean, I hate to break it to people, but the Fed kind of uh, doesn't, right. doesn't matter. Commercial banks do matter. Euro dollars do matter. That's how we run the system. And do you think it didn't happen this time because of a lack of demand for money or an unwillingness to make that those loans on the part of the commercial banks? Or was it a combination of the two? That is a great question, Stephanie, and the answer is both. Uh, but but the two are related. In other words, the unwillingness to, to lend and the unwillingness to spend are two sides of the same coin. It has right. to do confidence. With it's it's very flexible. Confidence. Uh, where are you going to invest? You know, um, I talked to top people at Exxon Mobil. They're like, why should you know uh, a new oil project? Right. Why would you? <laughs> it's got a 10 year horizon. So, so you want to do, you want to go to your board with a $15 billion exploratory infrastructure project. It's got a 10 year horizon to completion and a 20 year payout. And here you have the white house saying like right. today on, a, on a daily basis, we want to put an end to fossil fuels. We want to end the oil and natural gas industry, go get yourself an electric car. And that's not, that's the secretary of energy uh, and, uh, and, and others. Yeah. So, so you've got to be crazy as a CEO to go to your board and, and ask for that kind. So they're not doing it. Uh, right, do they we, just buy back shares instead. And that's <laughs> yeah, buy back shares, or I don't know what they do with it, but they're probably still doing write-offs from Russia. But, um, but the point is, uh, no, we're not getting the investment. And whether you finance it in bonds or bank loans, the the, the banks underwrite the bonds. It, it doesn't matter. It's not happening. And by the mm -hmm. same token, uh, individuals, unless you're stressed. Meaning, uh, you know, you lost your job or your savings are depleted and you've got to pay, you know, four fifty a gallon for gasoline to get to work. You might use your credit card, but there are limits on that. Mm -hmm. So um, and, and the third point is that even to the extent that M, M1 and M2 did did go up, not as much as one might have expected based on M0, but to the extent they did go up velocity collapsed. Uh, and mm -hmm. for you know, listeners who may not know, velocity is just a fancy word for the turnover of money. So um, if, I, if I have a dollar and I go out to dinner and tip the waiter and the waiter takes an Uber home and the Uber driver puts gas in her car, in that example, my dollar has velocity of three. It supported $3 of goods and services to tip mm -hmm. a, a ride and, and, and the gasoline. Um, but if I stay home and watch TV, my money velocity is zero. I left it in the bank. And I remind people 24 billion, or sorry, 24 trillion 
Hey. Uh, 24 trillion, I still get used to that for dollars. 24 trillion times zero is zero, at least where I went to school. So you don't have an economy without velocity. And since 2008, depending on the measure, but M1 velocity has since 2008, so uh, it was a 14 years, has gone from 10 to about 1.3. If you look at look at a graph, it looks like a, a, a Red Bull cliff dive. Yeah. So, um, so we're not getting, and that was the that was the biggest failure in Milton Friedman's thinking. Uh, Milton Friedman got some things right, but he got a couple of big things wrong. And he used the quantity theory of money, which is just you know, money supply times velocity. That's the turnover equals nominal GDP broken into a real part and an inflation part, and a price index. And and Friedman said, well. A mature industrial economy can really only grow about three and a half, four percent in real terms, and that's true. That's that's about right. You get surges; it can be worse, but that's that's a good estimate of what it can do. And you want um, inflation uh, the, or that number, the P in the, the equation, to be one, meaning you know nominal GDP times one equals real GDP. Uh, or sorry, real GDP times one equals nominal GDP. You don't want it to be inflation or deflation. And then, but then he said, velocity is constant. So if you know the other three <laughs> parts of the equation, it's like a thermostat. You can just dial the money supply up or dial the money supply down to uh -huh. maximum mm -hmm. real growth with no inflation. It's central bank nirvana. And he used to joke that you don't need a central bank or you just need a computer. But where Friedman was wrong, and this is where Irving Fisher was right, going back to the early 20th century, velocity is not constant. And in it was actually from 1950 to 1980, it was. So to credit Friedman during the bulk of his career, it actually was constant, mm -hmm. but it wasn't during the Great Depression or 1919 and it's not today, it has collapsed. Now, um, but even at that, our, our Austrian friends say, you know, well, that money had to go somewhere, you know, even, even in the other measures. But, um, but what, what that misses uh, is that People say, well, how can you have a dollar shortage with, with you know, trillions of dollars in new money? You have one quadrillion dollars of derivatives, off balance sheet mm -hmm. derivatives in the banking system as a whole. So that slice, whether it's um, the seven million, sorry, seven trillion of, uh, of M0 or a larger number, perhaps, you know, 24 trillion of M1, that has to support one quadrillion, quadrillion. Wow. of yeah. derivatives. Um, and uh, and by the way, for those who, who don't know, a, a quadrillion is a thousand trillion. That's what a quadrillion is. So um, now it's not dollar for dollar. You know, Jamie Dimon said, well, who cares? Just put up a little collateral. But uh, but you had to put up some collateral, not a quadrillion mm -hmm. dollars worth, but uh, but a lot. And then you get into the collateral issues. Like, well, what's good collateral? Mm -hmm. And the the answer is, and, what, and this is what the banks are saying to each other. And this goes back to my conversation with Walter Riston and the movie Rollover and all that. The banks are, and in fact, what happened in 2008, the banks are looking at each other saying, hmm, uh, I don't want your corporates. I don't want your mortgages. I don't even want your 10-year notes. Give me at a stretch, I'll give you, I'll take a two-year note with a haircut. Or what I really want are 30, 60, 90-day bills. I want yeah. treasury bills. And so you got to go out and get the treasury bills and they're dollar denominated, which means you need dollars. So if you're a Credit Suisse or Barclays or Hong Kong, Shanghai or Deutsche Bank, you don't live in a country that prints dollars. The U.S. does, but the European Central Bank doesn't. Yes. Um, and so, so there is this enormous demand for dollars, not because they love the dollar, but because they need to buy dollar denominated collateral of a very high quality in order to pledge as collateral to support the quadrillion dollar right. balance sheet derivatives position and plus any other trading they're doing. And so that's, that's the clue. That's the secret that un unlocks or the key that unlocks the whole mystery, which is it doesn't matter what the debt for now. Anyway, it doesn't matter what the debt to GDP ratio is mm -hmm. the total debt is the deficit is the labor force participation rate the week none of that matters what's going on not in m0 but in m1 and euro dollars in particular is a mad scramble uh for dollar based high quality dollar based collateral and that's what's driving the dollar and what's amazing about that that was a phenomenal um you know uh, way to put us where we are today and how we got here 
Um, but the frightening thing about it is obviously people are actually debating, you and I aren't, but other people are debating whether we're in a recession. And then to the extent anyone really agrees that we're in a recession, they imagine that it will be short and shallow and there's no chance that we go through another 2008 type scenario again. But it seems to me that's not even not remote a possibility, given the amount of debt we've accumulated and, you know, just the um, how stretched consumers are with negative disposable income and corporations, you know, zombie companies that can't even service their debt at rates from a year ago, blah, blah, blah. So if we go into another financial crisis, uh, given what you just highlighted, where does the dollar go then? Do we reach a point where the dollar pushes to a level where something breaks and everything resets? And, and if so, envision that playing out. That's exactly the right word. Something breaks. So everything I just described is playing out and there's data to back it up. And we get into um, not just an inverted treasury yield curve, which is interesting, you know, in um, the kind of twos to tens and um, uh, the other, well, twos to tens is the main sector where it's inverted. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but even more profoundly in the euro dollar futures uh, curve, which is, you know, I, I call the treasury yield curve um, a, uh, a short term uh, bet on a long term rate. The euro dollar futures curve is a long term bet on a short term rate. Because mm -hmm. what the euro dollar future is, it's like, I'm bet we're betting on what an overnight rate is going to be two years from now. Mm -hmm. And so, so okay, long-term bet on a short-term rate um, and it's inverted and it shouldn't be inverted. That should never, it does happen, but it should not happen. Yield curve should be upward sloping just because time value of money and uncertainty, et cetera. If I lend to you for a longer period of time or make a further forward bet, I should get a higher rate. Well, how come people betting on overnight rates uh, a year or two years from now think that rates are going to be lower? Well, the only explanation, and that shouldn't happen. The only explanation for that is we're going to go into recession. It's going to get a lot worse. But, but going back to your question, Steph, you made um, a really important distinction between a recession, even a bad one, uh, let alone <laughs> we've been in a depression since 2007. Mm -hmm and a financial crisis, because they're two different things. They, they can come together. But for example, in 1998, uh, we had an acute financial crisis and with long-term capital management. And I, had a, I negotiated that bailout, I had a front row seat on that one. But 1994, um, the tequila crisis, um, and there was a, the bond market massacre. Um, there have been, yeah, there, there have been these financial crisis, but there was no recession in 1998. Mm -hmm. In fact, the NASDAQ went to, you know, whatever, <laughs> it went to the moon. We were looking, we, long-term capital, we were licking our wounds after the meltdown and, you know, turning on CNBC and like watching, you know, uh, pets.com, the sock puppet and JDSU and the guy with the mm -hmm. beret and all these things, are, they're going to the moon. We're like, hey, we just got wiped out. Um, <laughs> but the, but the opposite is true. You can have a, um, a recession without a financial panic. Uh, 1990, we had you know kind of a mild recession. Um, there was no financial panic then. Uh, 2020 was interesting. That was, I don't know what to call it. I mean, technically a recession, but yeah. you know the the economy drops 31 percent annualized. And they say two quarters, first and second quarter of 2020, but it was really two months. I mean, if you break it down, it was March and April. They, they just happened uh -huh. to be. They happened to fall in two quarters and took both quarters negative, but it was really two months down 31% in annualized in two months and then up 35% by the third quarter. I mean, that was crazy. So maybe that's technically a recession, but that that's what, well, that's just what happens when you shut down the economy. We don't need to mm -hmm. be macroeconomists who say, Hey, you, show, you close down the economy. That's what happens. But there was not a financial panic stock market fell, but the banks didn't fail. Um, yeah. And nobody was worried about, you know, nobody's lined up to take the money out of Citibank, et cetera. Um, but sometimes they, so you can have recessions without panics. You can have panics without recessions. October 19th, 1987, Dow falls 22% one day, mm -hmm. no recession. But sometimes they do go together. In 2008, they did. We had both. We had an honest to goodness financial panic. Uh, everyone knows, you know, Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Lehman, 
AIG, but uh, I can tell you, and I've spoken to a lot of people, Morgan Stanley was days away. If you had oh. you talked to John Mack, he's like, hey, I, I got no time to bail out Lehman. We're trying to keep afloat ourselves. And then Goldman would have been behind that, probably City and um, yeah, maybe JP Morgan would have been the last one standing. Oh. Um, so, uh, and the economy collapsed and the stock market fell uh, well over 50%, I think 60%. So that was an example of both. And what I'm concerned about, and again, this is to your point, is we may be heading into both. And was every, if everything I said about what's behind the curtain, the plumbing, the financial system, acute dollar shortage, scramble for collateral, which leads to deleveraging, because if I can't get the collateral, I got to take the trade off. Yeah. Um, deleveraging of balance sheets, et cetera. Uh, which are the early warning signs of a global financial panic and a likely recession. Again, we've had the two quarters. It could get worse. Even if third quarter is positive, maybe it could drop hard in the fourth quarter once we get into the winter and winter weather and you know shutting down German manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, people in Germany are out in the woods chopping down trees right now. With, I know people in Germany chopping down trees. <laughs> yeah. And interesting, the, the extension course don't go that far, so they need gas-powered chainsaws to chop down the trees. So I don't know what they're the doing. The irony is trees. beyond, right? Uh. Uh, so, so that will get a lot worse. But we could very well, and, and there's a, there are feedback loops, of course. So we could very well be looking at a severe recession and a global liquidity crisis, two different things, but they could converge this winter, and that's definitely cause for concern. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, and yet the markets, you know, at least as judged by the last few days, seem to view the odds of a Fed pivot as extremely high. And therefore, you know, the dollar is probably peaked. And uh, why not just get long risk assets again? Uh, what's your view on that? Well, here we got to give got to give a little credit to uh, to Robert Schiller. He wrote a great book uh, about three years ago, or not that long ago, three four years ago maybe, called Narrative Economics, and um, I, I highly recommend it. And he, it's interesting. I was I'm reading it, you know, it's a really good book. And then he gets to his math models, like, oh, I know that one, because he um, he used the epidemiology model, what's called the SEIR model, uh, which um, I had studied years ago and I have used it in my own models. Um, but, uh, you know, you always hear the word, you know, the term financial contagion, you know, like when you know, Bear Stearns and Lehman and, you know, whatever, financial contagion. Well, it turns out the math is the same. I mean, the way a virus spreads or a bacteria infection spreads, it, mathematically in terms of uh, superlinear functions, and recursive functions is, is exactly the same as a financial panic. So that so when he imported that model, I was like, yeah, you got it. That's that's the right way to look at it. By the way, SEIR stands for uh, susceptible, meaning you could get the disease. Um, e uh, is exposed, so you actually got near it. I is infected and R is recovered. Um, huh. So you're susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, SEIR model. What they leave out is D for death. So there's you know, people die in, in pandemics, but uh, but then they're out of the population. But it's it's a way of um, seeing. Like I remember in the early days, like even in January 2020, um, uh, you know, very early days of the pan, of the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic um, it was COVID uh, is the disease. The SARS is the virus. Um, looking at because uh, Johns Hopkins put that website up early that you know that leaderboard mm -hmm. uh, and I started <laughs> I wrote a book about it later but or, or not not much after but uh, my son said yeah that, yeah nice you're really watching that website a lot but you would see um, you know with the Milan, Milan Fashion Week when the when the Chinese came over to Milan uh, leave aside whether they the Chinese were pushing them around the world that's a separate issue. Um, but there'd be 10 cases in Milan. And then the next day there would be, you know, 20. And then three days later, there'd be like 105 or something like that. But Wall Street was sitting there saying, eh, it's a hundred cases. Like, I feel sorry for them, but right. so what? But if you do, but if you do the math, that's a super linear super function. Linear. You don't have to be, uh, uh, you know, Fermat to say that's going to go into the hundreds and thousands and millions very in a matter of 30 days, which it did. So, um, but I was, so I was watching the, um, the, the exponent, not the apps, the number, and uh -huh. it was going up that way, but, um, but the same thing with financial. Theory. So anyway, so Schiller has this book. Now narrative is just a fancy word for a story. 
It's like, okay, you can call it a narrative and it means a lot of people buy into it, but it just means there's a story that people believe. And this goes back to uh, the greatest sociologist of the 20th century, Robert K. Merton. And I was, uh, I did have the privilege of meeting him late in life because he was the father of Robert C. Merton, who was my partner of long-term capital. My, Robert C. Merton won the Nobel Prize in economics. There is no Nobel Prize in sociology, but if there were, Robert K. Merton would have won it. But he's the one who came up with the phrase, the self-fulfilling prophecy. And the classic case is you wake up in the morning, the bank's fine, but somebody gets nervous and they run down and take all their money out. And somebody sees them and go, what are you doing? So I'm getting my money out of this bank. Okay, I better get my money out too. Next, and everyone's like, I don't want to be the last one out. Next thing you know, there's a line around the block. And by the end of the day, the bank shuts its doors and they're bankrupt. Um, but they weren't bankrupt at nine o'clock in the morning. It's, it's because a story spread. Uh, people believed it. People acted on it. And that's the key. Do you act on the story? You can make the thing you're worried about come true, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't true when the story started. And mm -hmm. um, and by the way, that in the 19, that actually happened in the 1930s, or, but there was no social media, but there's word of mouth. I mean, we've had, that's social media. It goes back through the uh, length of civilization. So, um, uh, and then he had, you know, some great narratives about the, you know, the, the, first, the first half of the Great Depression, 29 to 32. Yeah, unemployment was high and output was down and it was bad. Banks were shutting, but not everybody was unemployed. Not every business was shut. But if you, if you had a job or you had a business or you had money or you were wealthy, it was bad form to spend it. It was like, well, mm -hmm. you know, my neighbor's laid off or my friend's business is yeah. shut. I don't want to be out buying a new car right now. It looks bad. Um, but then when Roosevelt was elected in 33, 32 was the election, but 33 is sworn in, it flipped. It was like, hey, happy days are here again and go out and spend the money. And the economy actually grew between 33 and 36. The Fed screwed it up again in 37, but, but it grew and the stock market went up from 33 to 36 in the middle of the Great Depression. But his point was um, the narrative that it was bad form to spend money or you better go spend money, two different, two opposite narratives, but a flip from one to the other, but they both drove the economy. Nothing would have been better in 1930 for pe than for people to go spend money because yeah. that would have increased aggregate demand. So that's, that's a classic case study. But what, so I kind of knew a lot of that, but what I learned um, is that narratives can be true, sometimes, often they are, but they can be false. In other words, a completely false narrative can be extremely powerful if enough people buy into it. And that's what I'm saying about the Fed pivot. The Fed pivot is a narrative and it went like this. Um, so inflation takes everyone by surprise in last fall, late 2021. November, 2021, Jay Powell says, time to retire the word narrative. He actually said that in mm -hmm. uh, transitory, sorry, transitory. So time to retire mm -hmm. the word transitory. I think he said that in some congressional testimony. Uh, and then inflation goes to the roof, January, February, March, April. The stock market goes down. NASDAQ started going down actually in the last November. Dow, S&P start to go down in uh, uh, January and we're in a bear market by, by June. Um, it's still going down. But then after the Fed raised rates in March, uh, May, and June, the, and then the yield curve inverted and some people mm -hmm. weren't looking at them, but some people were. Uh, the narrative is like, well, wait a second. The yield curve inversion is telling us that rates are going to be lower six months from now. Inflation's cooling off a little bit, and it has. You know, the price of gas has come down mm -hmm. a little bit, um, and so they're going to have to cut rates. That was the pivot. They're going to have to cut rates in January, February, right. and rate cuts are good for stocks or so buy stocks. So then, it's right. like, well, then we get this rally in July and August, and the stock markets, you know, recovering a lot of this. Not all the lost ground, by the way, but, but a lot of it in the stock yeah. market's rally, all based on the Fed pivot narrative which I never bought into. I mean, I, you don't want to stand in front of a moving train. I wasn't going to short the S&P, but I, I did not buy into the narrative. I said for, for two reasons. Number one, oh, inflation came down from nine to eight. Well, that's nice, but you're, you say you want to get it to two. You're a long yeah. way from two. And how much demand destruction, how many rate hikes, uh, how much do you have to do to really destroy the economy to get inflation down to two? The answer is a lot. Uh, and tell me why that's good for stocks. And it's not. Right. Uh, but, but the other reason is, and this is a little more sophisticated analytically, but just because the yield curves are telling you that market pros think rates are going to be lower, it doesn't mean the Fed's going to cut. 
I mean, yeah. th that is the message, but it doesn't mean the Fed's going to get the message. How many times does the Fed get things right? The answer is never. So, Zero, exactly. So, and, and then, of course, this call comes to head, I think, August 26th at, at Jay Powell's Jackson Hole speech. I've never heard a Fed chairman, I've been following this a long time, never heard a Fed chairman use the word pain twice in the same paragraph, but he said, this is going to cause pain, it's going to be very painful. Uh, and then, so that kind of bursts the bubble of the pivot narrative. And then the stock market goes down, I think, six straight days. They get a little, so what's going on now? I don't know. Maybe a little short covering, maybe, you know, the, the buy the dips crowd have not gone away. They're still around. Um, the, the uh, I'll say talking heads, uh, I guess I'm one, but, you know, the, the cheerleaders, I'll put it that way. Uh, the Wall Street cheerleaders have never gone away. The Wall Street always wants to sell you something. The, um, People who think the Fed knows what they're doing, there's some of those, a lot of those actually <laughs> yeah. on Bloomberg. Um, and uh, and so and the buy the dips crowd. So yeah, okay, but but the fundamentals have not changed. The uh, recession is here, or if it, if, if it's if, the, if we get a little breathing room, it's gonna go down really hard this winter. All the problems we talked about, and most importantly, Jay Powell told us, I would say that. Right. Uh, forecasting the consequences of Fed policy is really difficult, but forecasting Fed policy is the easiest thing in the world because they tell you what they're going to do. Yeah. You just ha you just have to listen and know. There's, there's a little so you need a decoder ring. There's some secret language, and you got to know who the they they always have a reporter du jour. There's one reporter right. <laughs> that they leak to in the old days when they before they did this. It, it was primary deal or economists, uh, you know, oh. guys like, you know, great guys like Lacey Hunt and, you know, people at Arby Lanston and, you know, some of the lesser known primary dealers, the Fed said nothing publicly. They were a black hole, but they would leak it to their favorite primary deal of the week. Um, and you could kind of front run the Fed legally because they're part of the government uh, for a while. Uh -huh. Now they do it through reporters, but right now it's a, a Nick Timiaros of the Wall Street Journal. So if I read it in USA Today, I, I throw it in the trash. But if I if Nick Timiaros says 75 basis points, I'm like, okay, 75 basis points. That's right. easy. But the hard part is, is what's going to happen as a result of that. And the Fed's thinking maybe hard landing, but not too bumpy. Uh, and I'm thinking more like a plane crash. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, I'm just blown away by their complacency about raising rates. I mean, we um, people give me a hard time for saying this, but on a percentage basis, it's true. The Fed has never raised rates this aggressively in this short period of time in history, not even during Volcker. I mean, he doubled Fed funds. Um, you know, they've taken it up tenfold in less than six months. And the idea that the level of rates is still low is obviously irrelevant because all the companies who are borrowing at those record low rates are going to have to roll their debt at substantially higher rates. So, you know, it seems to me like there's this overwhelming complacency, both on the part of the Fed and then the people who are buying into this pivot thesis that, well, you know, we'll get through this, it'll be short and shallow, the Fed will pivot, and we'll be right back to the rates. <laughs> well, you're, you're exactly right. And assuming they do 75 basis points on September 21st, which is my forecast, but like I say, Fed kind of told us, um, right. now you're at um, the target rate for Fed funds is now 3%. Three. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, sorry, three and a quarter, but uh, at, at the top of the range. But... Um, <laughs> It was zero on March 1st. So for people to say, oh, three and a quarter doesn't sound that high. It was zero on March 1st, three and right. a quarter percentage points in, uh, eight, in eight months or less. Uh, that's unbelievable. And they got two more meetings this year. And even if, you know, you could say 50 basis points in November, because it's, you know, three working days before the election. They don't want to be too, you know, Jay Powell may You're be right. a Republican. Jay Powell <laughs> may be a Republican, but he's, but he's, smart enough to know the Fed wishes they could keep out of politics. Now they can't and they don't, but they wish they could. And the last thing he wants to do is 75 basis points three days before the election. So yeah. uh, three working days, because they got the weekend in between. So, um, so let's just say 50, but you do another 50 in December. I mean, now you're at four, and a, four to four and a quarter range in uh, nine months. Yeah. That's, so maybe that's extraordinary. Well, we already are getting a window into what's coming down the pipeline with housing. 
I mean, it's obviously the front lines of the economy being the most interest sensitive sector. And I mean, we've seen, what is it, 40% decline from the peak in new home sales? I mean, these are breathtaking. And the peak right. wasn't even a year ago. That's not right. even year on year. That's like nine months ago, down 40%. And I, you know, I always say if volume precedes price, this, you know, this is going to get ugly. And that's just the first warning sign. I don't know. I mean, I, maybe I'm too bearish, but it just seems to me like the Fed is maybe push too far already, but they've got to keep going because as you pointed out, you know, with the inflation at eight, sure, it's down a little bit, but that's not a number that anyone's going to view as reasonable. Right. Including or starting with the Fed, they, uh, um, they, they say too. Now uh, as read one analyst, he said, well, maybe we'll just get to three. Uh, well, first of all, Jay Powell's not saying that. And secondly, good luck getting to three uh, without enormous damage. And, uh, and, and stuff, not not to get too geeky, but I, sometimes I can't help myself. There's something, there's a concept. It's, it's not that difficult. It's called DBO1, which is the dollar value of one basis point. And what it means is if interest rates go up, uh, you know, whatever, 25 basis points or down mm -hmm. 25 basis points, what's the change in the price of securities? Uh, and that's what's the, the, you know, the rates up, prices down, rates down, prices up. That's just right. basic bond math. But, but it's not uniform or linear at all levels of rates. So huh. when, when you at higher rates, the DVO one is lower and at lower rates, the DVO one is higher, which means the impact of every basis point increase in interest rates is greater in terms of the, the price lower at the lower uh, at lower levels. Right. So uh, in other words, raising rates from uh, I'll just say two to four for a range is much more damaging to prices than going from uh, eight to 10. And eight to ten percent, much higher interest rates, whole different world. But the impact of that on bond prices is less than going from two to four, where it's like you're just putting these bonds in the cellar, and that plays out in derivatives world. So that's another factor, um, uh, along with scarcity of collateral, you know, shortage of dollars, uh, you know, quadrillion dollars in notional deleveraging balance sheets, and a, and a higher DBO one, meaning these interest rate hikes do more damage per basis point to bond prices than if they were at a higher level. So, so far from saying, oh, we're low levels, who cares? It's quite the opposite at, at low levels. That's when the damage is done. Yeah, which kind of brings us to the question of if the destruction is going to be so much greater um, and the Fed, in my view, I don't know what your view is. How do they respond to that when it's clear, you know, when the market's down, let's say 50 percent, the economy is in a severe recession, not just some two quarter brief affair. Um, I presume the Fed will then pivot um, or and what is your view? It would seem to me like they not only pivot, but they are going to have to print more money than we've ever seen before. Yeah, no, I Stephanie's interview with Jim will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. And remember, we're continuing our new practice of publishing my top takeaways from these weekly videos. To get mine from Stephanie's interview with Jim for free, just go to wealthion.com slash Adam's Notes. And finally, if the challenging macro outlook that Jim has detailed in this interview has you feeling a little nervous about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth, keeping in mind the trends and risks that Jim's mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next in part two of Stephanie's interview with Jim Rickards.